Okay, Math 43, we're gonna head into mean land and we're gonna do independent populations right now. So we'll do a couple of examples where the um, populations are independent and then we'll take a look at what happens when you have paired samples. So when I say unknown standard deviations, I mean we don't know sigma, we don't know the population standard deviation, but we'll always know S. You'll always know your sample standard deviation. So for mean land, similar to proportion land, right? you see that for the null, you have mu1 equals mu2. And that's different than what we saw in chapter 9, because in chapter 9, you saw something like mu1 equals 75. right? So again, we don't have a number in the null hypothesis when we're in chapter 10, when we're comparing two means, where we did have a, a number in our null hypothesis in chapter nine when we were comparing one mean to a given number. All right, so let me erase this because this is the chapter nine stuff. All right, and look at how much fun your test statistic is. Oh my, right? Statistic minus parameter over a standard error. This is a good time. What is probably more of a good time is your degrees of freedom formula. And we're gonna need that whenever we're using TCDF for our p-value. And look at how much fun that is. You take your first sample standard deviation, square it, divide it by the sample size, add it to the second sample's standard deviation square and divide it by its sample size, square that. That's just your numerator. Oh my God, we're, we're not even halfway done. And then on your denominator, you take each of these individual fractions and square them, right? And then divide them by n minus one or excuse me, n sub one minus one and n sub two minus one respectively, and then add them. So look at, that is just a good time, all right? If you have nothing better to do on a Friday night and no judgment when I say this, crunch this. It is a good time. What we're gonna use instead is we will get this from technology. So we will use our TI 8384s to get this number. But like I said, if you're feeling a little like crazy on a Friday, just try one. Try it once. It's fun to do it once. Well, maybe not fun, but it's a it's a good it's just a good um, problem to go through once, and then you really start to appreciate your TI eighty three eighty four or just any piece of technology. All right. So our alternate again, it's going to have no numbers in it. It'll just have mu one and mu two, and it'll either be greater than, less than, or not equals to. So again right-tailed, left-tailed, or two-tailed test. And since we're not gonna be on the standard normal curve, we're gonna be on the T-curve, we're gonna be taking areas to the right and left of our, our test statistic from step 10, and we're gonna be using TCDF to calculate a bunch of um, p-values. Assumptions here are similar, but you know, a little different than we saw in in chapter nine. So we still want randomly selected samples or potentially our samples, plural, represent our population or treatments are randomly assigned. We definitely need to check if we have independent or paired samples because when we're in mean land, both of those options are available in chapter 10. And if you have independent samples, we're gonna do the method that we're about to talk about. And if you have paired samples, you gotta do a different method. So you, you need to assess whether things are independent or paired. In proportion land, we're only gonna deal with independent samples. But in mean land, both of those options are out there. And when I say both, I mean independent and paired. Um, for normality, right, population distributions are normal. And I say distributions, we need plural, we need them both. Or sample sizes are large enough, meaning both are greater than or equal to 30. You can't just have one being greater than or equal to 30 for the central limit theorem to kick in. They both have to be greater than or equal to 30. Or graphs, plural, show plausible normality. So if we go to the graph version, you owe me two box plots or two histograms or two normal probability plots. And when we're on the T distribution, it's because we only know S's, we don't know sigmas. So again, if you know sigmas, if you ever for some reason know the population standard deviations, you can run a Z test, right? You can do the two sample mean Z test. Um, but like I said, we're only gonna run the T's. You make your decision. And here's our, our standard note, right? As the sample size gets larger, the shape of the T distribution gets closer to the shape of the Z distribution, right? We saw that back in chapter eight. 
It was true in chapter nine, and it's true in chapter 10. The larger your samples, the more robust your inference procedure, the more likely skewness will not affect your plausible normality. For smaller samples, we need our graphs to be roughly symmetric with no outliers. And as n, get, and as n gets larger, we allow some wiggle room for skewness. And as n approaches 30, we know the sampling distribution for means approaches normality, and many statisticians will actually use a z-score all right, and normal CDF when, they, when their sample sizes are larger than 30. We're not going to, but it is out there. All right, so we're going to flip the page, and we're going to look at our first two-sample hypothesis test in Meanland. All right, I'll see you in a bit. Bye. Okay, gang, let's try example two. So again, with all of these problems, start with what is the variable? So the mean lasting time of two competing floor waxes is to be compared. 35 floors are randomly assigned to test each wax. Both populations have normal distributions. The data are recorded in the table below. Does the data indicate that wax one is more effective than wax two and we've got a 5% alpha? All right. So in terms of what variable we're looking at, it looks like we're calculating the number of months that these floor waxes last, right? So the lifetime of these floor waxes. And I, I see the word average all over the place here. So I've got mean. I saw that was one of the first words I noticed. There's sample mean in here. I see that this is number of months. So I have some units, right? So this is three months. This is 2.9 months. Another thing that I, I would pay attention to is I heard that both populations are normally distributed, so I, I would keep that in mind. So as I'm looking at this, right, I, I'm going to just take notes on the side here. I know I'm in mean land. I'm looking at averages. I have a numerical variable. All right, in terms of the number of samples, it looks like I have two groups, right? I have the floors that got wax one. And then there's the floors that got wax two. So I have two samples or two treatment groups. And then I have to decide if these are independent or paired. And it said right here that we have 35 floors assigned to each wax. So there are 35 floors receiving wax one. And there are 35 floors receiving wax two. So since those are two separate groups that are not connected, I have no reason to think that the, the lifetime for the floors that receive wax one have any bearing on the lifetime for the floors that receive wax two. So I'm gonna just make sure I noted that these are independent samples. And because I'm in mean land, I know I'm gonna be using a t-test. All right, so I have all my little notes here to the side. Great. And then I gotta start with step one, which is always to define your parameters. So since I have two samples, I need to define two mu's. I'm gonna need mu sub one and mu sub two. And just so that I can stay consistent, I'm gonna assign mu sub one to be the uh, true average number of life, uh, excuse me, number of months that the floor wax lasts if you get wax one, all right? And then I'm gonna have mu two be the true average number of months that the floor wax lasts if you're applying wax two. And that sounds kind of, it, it kind of sticks in my mouth when I even try to say mean number of months floor wax lasts. So I'm just gonna use this, right? I'm gonna just say um, that we have the average lifetime or the average life span. So I'm gonna say that mu one is the true average lifespan for wax one. And I'm gonna say that comes in months, that's the units. And then I'm just gonna repeat that for wax two. All right, and again, you could say true average number of months floor wax one lasts, true average number of months floor wax two lasts. That, that's fine, okay? Now when it comes to our null, as we start to look at this, right, we're gonna go mu sub one equals mu sub two. So again, take note, there are no numbers in this null, all right? I'm just gonna set the two means equal to each other. So what I'm saying, what I'm hypothesizing is that neither floor one is better than floor, uh, excuse me, neither wax one nor wax two is better. They both last about the same amount of time on these floors. So I'm gonna say H naught, right? We've got mu one equaling mu two, okay? And then let's take a look at the alternate. 
and see if we were slanted in one way or the other. And, and again, if we're not, I'll just put the not equals to sign. But this says, does the data indicate that wax one is more effective? Well, if wax one was more effective, I would expect it to last longer. So I would expect mu one to be greater than mu sub two. So that's the slant they're giving me. Okay, I've got a right tailed test. And before I get going too much further, just taking a look at it, um, these sample means, right? These are the statistics right here because this was the data from um, the first 35 floors. This is the data from the second 35 floors. Um, they look pretty close, right? They only deviate from each other by about 0.1 months. And in reference to the standard deviation, right, I'll just put that this difference here is 0.1. And if you look at it in comparison to the standard deviation, that's not a whole lot. So I don't think this gives me any evidence that mu1 is really greater than mu2. I get that it lasted 0.1 months longer, but that's not that much, relatively speaking, when you compare it to the standard deviation. Okay, so let me erase this, just I don't want that in there, okay? So I'm gonna scoot this up just a bit. All right, so we can see, let me move it to the, so the table is at the top, okay? So step four is always your alpha. So I'm gonna go with, I'm gonna keep 5%. We, we were given 5% and I would default to that anyways. All right, so for assumptions, let's take a look at our assumptions. Okay, so we have a whole bunch of options here for option one. So I wanna look, did I have randomly selected samples? Did my samples represent my population? Or were my treatments randomly assigned? Well, if we look at the phrasing here, right, it actually says that 35 floors were assigned to each wax. So I have that my treatments were randomly assigned. So I didn't randomly select the floors themselves. They probably are just gonna give me a batch of floors, right? Go to this building, do all the floors in that building. They'll probably cluster it. But inside that building, the treatments will be randomly assigned. Okay. So let's see what assumption number two is. All right, I need you to take note that you did have independent samples. And this will always be the second step. We wanna confirm, do we have independent or are they paired? And it, when they're independent, you're gonna follow this, this right up. When they're paired, well, we're gonna to get to that in, the, in a couple of examples. But I have independent samples here. All right, and then the big one, normality. Let's see how we achieve normality here. I've got a few options, right? I could have been told that the population distributions were stated to be normal. I could have that both sample sizes are larger than 30, or 30 or larger, excuse me, so that the central limit theorem kicks in. Or uh, I could graph, graphs plural, two box plots, two histograms, something to that effect to show normality was plausible. All right, so let's see, were my population distribution stated to be normal? And let me get this back into view so we can see it. And if you remember, I highlighted it at the beginning, right? It says here, both populations have normal distributions. So I know my sampling distributions are normal, great. And even if I didn't, I want you to take note that I had 35 floors in each sample. So the central limit theorem would have kicked in anyways. So to, to do this right up, I, I don't care which assumption you go with in terms of, you could tell me the population distributions were normal, or you could say that both sample sizes are 30 or higher. I'm gonna opt for population distributions stated to be normal. Okay. If you wanted to do it the other way, you could have said N1, in this case happened to be N2, which was equal to 35, and that was greater than or equal to 30. So, so both of those write-ups are completely acceptable. All right, so step four, if we take a look at step four, or I should say assumption four, right? It's saying, hey, can you just write out the sample standard deviation? All right, as long as you know those statistics, you can run the t-test. If you ever happen to know the sigmas, you would run the z-test. 
All right, so we're going to say we knew S of 1 was 0 0.33 months, and S of 2 was 0 0.36 months. All right, so we got that. The next thing we got to do is state the name of the distribution that we're going to be using. To save some space, I'm going to come over here because I'm going to need a bunch of it when I get to those later parts. So I have that step six, whenever you're running a test in mainland, we're going to use the T distribution. All right, in terms of the test name, oops, let me write the number seven. All right, we're gonna do two samples. We're in Meanland. We're running a t-test, so that's what I'm gonna write. Two sample mean, and then we'll go t hypothesis test. All right, eight degrees of freedom. Okay, so let's take a look at our degrees of freedom. This is our formula, and it is a beast, right? And I said that we're gonna use our TI-8384 calculator to get this, and I'm gonna do that in just a moment. I'm gonna show you how to go to your calculator. But I do wanna mention just uh, like a, a gut check or, or, or a good estimate on your degrees of freedom. You have at least as many degrees of freedom as your smaller sample size minus one. All right, so I'm gonna say it again. You have at least as many degrees of freedom as your smallest sample size minus one. Now in this case, all right, if we look at the setup, right, both of our sample sizes were 35. So what I'm trying to say here is I know I have at least 34 degrees of freedom. I actually have much closer to 70, or I should say to 68. And if you're wondering where I'm getting 68, all right, if I were to think about this, I have 35, floors and another 35 floors. So I have 70 floors in total, but they're out of two groups. So if I was to lose two degrees of freedom, one for each of those treatment groups, I have 68 degrees of freedom. And when we crunch that really ugly formula, all right, this thing, we're gonna get a number pretty close to 68. All right, but this one's harder to predict. So that's why I said, if you wanna play, a, uh, play it safe and go with a conservative estimate, we always take the, low of your, the lower of your two sample sizes, and in this case, they happen to both be 35, so the lower one is still 35, and we would do one minus, or that number minus one, and so you know you had at least 34 degrees of freedom that's playing it safe, but you're actually much closer to 68. And again, we'll use our calculator in just a moment to get this official number. I'm gonna leave it blank for right now because I don't have that official number. All right, so step nine is that massive test statistic. All right, so I'm gonna copy this formula down onto step nine, and then in step 10, we're gonna plug in our numbers for our particular problem. So let me scoot this way up, okay? And let's start to put in step nine here. So I'm gonna have a T-score. It's going to be a statistic minus a parameter over a standard error. All right, so let's start to talk about what numbers we're going to plug in. So I don't think I can get both the table, oh, I can, I can just get the table and this formula into view. Okay, so when we're working with this, right? What was X1, oh, and this should, excuse me, these should have bars over them because we're looking at sample means. All right, what was the average lifespan for WAX1's sample? Three months. What was the average lifespan for life, wax two sample? 2.9 months. So I know I'm gonna have three here, 2.9 here. All right, in terms of the sample standard deviations, you know they are 0.33 and 0.36 respectively. And in terms of N1 and N2, you know they're both 35. So I'm gonna plug in those numbers. But then we gotta figure out what the null difference is. Okay, if the null is true, if mu1 is truly equal to mu2, right? If these two things are equal, then when I subtract them, their difference 
should be zero. Right, so let me just push this here or write this here. If mu one, excuse me, if mu sub one is equal to mu sub two, if that equation, the one that we're assuming to be true, the one in the null, if that's true, if I moved mu sub two to the left side of the equation, I would have that their difference was equal to zero. So if the null is true, if mu one really equals mu two, then this difference would be zero. Okay, so with that, let's plug in our numbers. Okay, so here, going with step 10, we are gonna have three minus 2.9 minus a zero. Over the square root, we're gonna have 0.33 squared over 35 plus, what was my other deviation? 0.36 squared over 35. All right, now it's at this point I'm gonna pause. I wanna to flip to the calculator so you can see how your calculator can help you with this write-up. So I'm gonna get the number for step 10 for my calculator's output screen. I'm gonna pick up step 11. I'm gonna pick up step 12. And don't forget, we're also gonna pick up step eight. All right, so I'm gonna get degrees of freedom from that calculator screen as well. So I'm gonna cut over to my calculator, show you how to work those, and then we're gonna come back here. All right, I'll see you in a bit. Hey Math 43, let's take a look at how to run a two sample t-test on our calculators. And like always, I would recommend that you run the test on your calculator first, and then use that calculator output screen to help inform your write-up. So when I run these hypothesis tests, I always do the technology first. I like to just jump to the end and see what's happening. And then I'll, I'll, I'll do my write-up. So we head over to stat, we're tests. Now we had two independent samples and we were in mean land. So if you don't see the word prop, which are only popping up here on five and six, it's implied that the rest of them are in mean land. Okay, so one through four are in mean land. And then on top of that, we had two samples or two treatments randomly assigned, right? We had the 35 floors that had wax one or received wax one and the 35 floors that received wax two. So since we're in two sample land, we can narrow our, our scope down to option three or option four. And now there are some stats folks out there that believe since we had 35 floors for each wax, and since that hit the threshold in mean land of 30 or higher, the central limit theorem would have kicked in. Some folks say, hey, just go ahead and run a two sample Z test. I don't live in that camp. I'm a big believer in the T test. Um, having slightly more variability because we don't have that population standard deviation. But I, I, I will, at the end of this, I'll circle back and do that option just so we can compare the two. But for our class, we're going to run t-tests when we're in mean land. All right, so let's go fill in our um, data, or I should say our statistics. We don't have raw data. I didn't give you 35 data values for the floors that receive wax one and an additional 35 data values for the floors that receive wax two. We're not putting anything into lists. I gave you statistics. So here we go, let me scroll down. And then the average lifespan in wax one, it looks like it was three months and it deviated by 0.33 months. Right? Um, there were 35 floors. And for wax two, we had an average lifespan of 2.9 months with an average deviation of 3.6 months. And there were also 35 floors there. Um, let me remind myself, I had, it looks like a greater than alternate. So that's already highlighted. I'll keep it there. You never want to pull your data. It's not something we're doing in here. And then you, your two options, calculate or draw. I'm going to hit calculate first. So there it is, right? There's our test statistic. There's our p-value, which I also could have gotten from TCDF. Here are our degrees of freedom, right? There's that really ugly formula we could use. And I can scroll up and show you that ugly formula, right? Look at that beast. We could use that formula if we wanted to. I think it's obviously much easier just to get it from technology. And again, there's always this safe rule of thumb in that if, if you weren't sure, like if you didn't have technology to say the degrees of freedom are definitely 67.5, what you can do is you can take your smaller of your two sample sizes, and in this case, they're both 35, and you could subtract one, and you can say, well, I have at least 34 degrees of freedom. Like, that's our, our minimum threshold. We know we have at least 34. It's actually closer to 70, but it's not quite at 70. All right, so we got that. Here are my two sample means that I'll be using. Well, they were given to me, but you use them in step 10. There's your sample standard deviations and your sample sizes. 
right? So we've got all of that information. I also could have run this. Let me go to four and let me draw. And since I had about, what, 11% in my p-value, it is going to shade something for me. I had a right-tailed test, so some area under the curve should show up on the right. There it is. Okay, so again, that's running a two-sample t-test. Let me show you what it would look like to run a two-sample z-test, and I want to compare the p-values here, because that's, the, that's the significant part that's going to change. So if I went over here and ran two-sample z, instead because I was that believer that said, well, I've got 35 observations, so I know I'm on the standard normal, or I, I'm on a normal um, distribution, so I'm good to go. If we did it that way, we would have to put in our sample standard deviations, our S's, as our sigma. So we're going to pretend we know that those are the population standard deviations when they're not. All right, and then this data is usually saved. Yeah, so here's all of my data. Right, I had the greater than alternate. I'm going to hit calculate. Right, so you see that my, my z-score is the same, but my p-value changes slightly. Because if you remember for the standard normal curve, if you compare it to the t-curve, right, the t's have slightly higher tails and a lower peak. So there's going to be just a little bit more area under that curve. And it is really just a little bit more. Right Here was 0.115, so a little bit more area than 0.113. So you can see there's not too much of a difference between a two sample Z and a two sample T. And we, we would have the same conclusion, right? We're gonna fail to reject the null. And that's part of why some statisticians just say, okay, I'm fine with it, go with the two sample Z. Okay, we're gonna flip back to our handwritten work and finish out this write-up. Thanks guys, bye. Okay, now that we've seen this all on our calculator, let's just review it up for a little bit. Okay, so I'm going to use my calculator screen. I'm going to hit, let me clear this out. We were here on our last problem. So I'll hit stat. I'm going to go over to tests. And again, I'm no longer in proportion land. I have means. So I'll be somewhere in these first four options. And you can see the twos hanging out here. That's the method you use when you have two samples rather than one, right? These are the one sample t-test and z-test. These are the two sample t-test and z-test. And in this class, we're going to use the fourth option, all right, when we have independent samples. All right, so I'm going to go here. I have summary statistics. So as I look through this, my first sample mean was 3. My, second, or my first standard deviation was 0.33, and I had 35 floors. My second average, my second sample mean was 2.9. That deviation was 0.36, and I had 35 floors. You will, uh, let's take a look. Our, our alternate, I think, was a greater than, okay? When it comes to pooling your data, we're never gonna pool in here. All right, so we're just gonna go down here and hit calculate. And let's take a look at what we have. First of all, I want you to see the degrees of freedom, right? 67.49, right? So let's do 67.49 here. That is my degrees of freedom. I want you to take a look. There's my test statistic. So there's my numerical answer to step, uh, and I'll go out one more decimal, um, to step 10. I can also see my p-value here. I want you to remember it's about 0.115. But let's talk about how you could get this p-value if you knew this number. I always want to make sure we're clear on how do we get from step 10 to 11 in any of these hypothesis tests. And you always need to use a CDF. So what I mean by that, we know our p-value is a probability, all right? And all probabilities, when they're on continuous numerical variables, it's always an area under a curve, and we can find those using a, some kind of CDF, normal CDF, TCDF. When we get to chapter 11, we're gonna use something called chi-square CDF and FCDF. But for right now, we're gonna use a TCDF. We're on the T distribution, so we'll use the TCDF. So I'm gonna put my letter as my T here, all right, I've got to decide, do I have a greater than or a less than? Well, we go to the alternate for that. You have a right tail, so you want, or I should say a right tailed test, so you want the right tail of your graph. So we're gonna go 1.211 here. So I'm gonna say TCDF, this is gonna be low, high, and then we're gonna go degrees of freedom. All right, and let's see what that number is equal to. And 
I, I get that we know it's going to be 0.115. I can definitely see that from the output screen here, but I just want to remind us if I go TCDF, we're going to have 1.211 to infinity, and then our degrees of freedom was 67.49. So keep that number, 0.114, in mind, right? And you can see it's 0.115. It's pretty close, right? This was 0.11. 498, this is 505, so it's, they're very, very similar. So we have basically 0.115 here. Okay, now let me use my calculator, go through all of these options again, but let's draw. And before I draw, I actually do expect that I'll see some area under that curve because you should be able to see 11% of your curve. That seems reasonable. So let's see what we got, something that's going to look pretty close to the standard normal curve. There it goes. So I've got my bell shaped, and there's all that area under the curve, right? Because my p-value is almost 12%. All right, so let me move this up, and we'll start making that graph. So for step 12, let's draw some area under a curve. I am on the T distribution. Zero would be under the peak. And my test statistic from step 10 was about 1.211. And I need the area to the right. I have a right tailed test. And as I graph that, I, I actually feel like I didn't do the greatest job graphing. I feel that's larger than 12%, but it's good enough. All right, I, I'm, I'm fine with that. Um, so I think 1.211 might have been a little bit more to the right, but the, and you get the idea. This is relatively small. This is relatively small. All right, decision time. So we need to decide if we're going to reject or fail to reject. So for this problem, my p-value, is it less than alpha or, if it's, or is it greater? So we had about an 11% p-value. Our alpha was the default of 0.05. So we have a greater than situation, right? My p-value is greater than alpha, so I will fail to reject H0, meaning I do not have sufficient evidence for the alternate. So let's see what that would look like. All right, we're going to say because... That's a because, it almost looks like BIC. All right, because our p-value is greater than alpha, we fail to reject H0. All right, so we do not have sufficient evidence for the alternate, so let me write here, we do not have sufficient evidence all right so let's see what our options are I want to go back to how this was originally written okay so I'm going to scoot all the way up here okay so there's a couple things I want to I want to point out you have a, a couple options for your write-up you could say we do not have evidence for the alternate and write this out in words we do not have evidence that the true average lifespan of wax one is greater than the true average lifespan of wax two. That's great. That will work. So I will write that up in a moment, right? So again, if I wanted to say this alternate out in words, we do not have evidence that mu sub one, right? The true average lifespan of wax one is greater than the true average lifespan of wax two. Okay. Another option is you could say we do not have evidence that wax one is more effective than wax two. You're more than welcome to take the phrase that's towards the end of this setup, right? And, and just repeat it back to me. So let me write those two options for you. And you pick which one works best for you. Okay, so here we go. Oops, let me get this down just a bit. All right, so we do not have sufficient evidence that the true average lifespan 
of wax one is greater than the true average lifespan of wax two. All right, so that's one totally acceptable answer. All right, and here comes the other one. I'm gonna use the phrasing that was just written in the problem. So we do not have sufficient evidence that wax one is more effective than wax two. So that's also a perfectly acceptable answer. And something I want to point out, in case I haven't already, is that the write-up for 13 is pretty similar regardless of which way your decision goes. Okay? And what I mean by that is these two write-ups are similar with the exception of four words. So if you fail to reject H0, you get two extra words in this first sentence. And then you hear, over here, you get two extra words in the second sentence, right? So if you have got a greater than, you're gonna write fail to and a do not. If it was less than, don't write the fail to, don't write the do not. So, for example, if this had said less than, and I know it didn't, but just for example, if it had said less than, I would not have these words do not, right? I would erase that and I would erase the fail to. Right. So I wouldn't have the fail to reject, we would just reject, and then we would have sufficient evidence. So regardless of which way you go, whether the p-value is less than alpha or greater than alpha, those write-ups are very similar. And before we get out of here, let me just have a bonus question. Which type of error might you have made? So this goes back to chapter nine, but when you fail to reject the null, all right, and another way is of saying that is we're gonna keep the null because we're gonna hold on to this idea that the null is true. All right, well, if we were erroneous in that, right, if the alternate was really true, if the second equation was really true, we might have made a type two error. All right, or you can just remember, if you ever fail to reject the null, it means you might've made a type two. If you reject it, you might've made the type one. All right, so with that, that's uh, your first look at Meanland. We're going to run another one in just a bit. All right, I'll see you. Bye.